Hey, podcast world, it's FNO and SureTech. Hi, Rob Beller. How are you today? I'm fabulous. I'm here with Mr. Lee Boyd, coming to us from Waco, Texas, as usual. Hi, everybody. What about you? Where are you at today? I'm in rainy, cold Sacramento. It doesn't look rainy. Well, that's because you can't see outside. Oh, yeah, you're inside. You have to trust. You have to take my word, Lee, a little more often. You know, trust is the foundation of a good relationship. You know, I read that somewhere. And I want our listeners to trust us to bring them great information about InsureTech. Yeah, new innovative ideas, companies, and themes that they can really use in their own workplace. Right. So today we have our episode number two, if you will, on water. Yeah. Or is it really about water? It's about claim prevention and customer engagement. It's about IoT. It's about telematics for the home. It's a really interesting jumble of stuff, and that is Mr. Rule Peters, who's the CEO and co-founder of Roost. Yeah, Roost is a really interesting product. Uh, I hope today that we're going to get a really jump into what they do, but they really, in their words, they make dumb things smart. So they use batteries and Wi-Fi technology to make applications smart uh, where you can actually get real information in real time from these devices. And very accessible to a large market because it's a very affordable solution. And so we're going to hear all about that. Rule's a great guy. And uh, we're going to hear his story and the Roost story and what it all means just on the other side of this introduction. So, Lee... Yes, Rob. Without further ado, let's get into our interview with Rule Peters from Roost. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We have a special guest coming to us all the way from the West Coast, Mr. Rule Peters, CEO and co-founder of Roost. How are you doing, Rule? Excellent. Thanks for having me, Rob. Much appreciated. It's a pleasure to have you. You know, I, I just want to say that I first met you or saw you speak. I don't know exactly when, but it seemed like years ago and you were with Roost. So you guys are not a Johnny come lately in this insure tech scene, are you? No, we've been around for a little while uh, here. Uh, we started the company back in the middle of 2014. So it was about five years ago as we started exploring this connected home space. And from pretty much the beginning, uh, I would say, or at least in that first year, we started getting interest from, from insurance companies. And over time, we have actually made that our, our exclusive focus to where today we're, we're working with a lot of insurance carriers to help them take advantage of IoT and smart home uh, in general. Okay, so let's just jump right in and, and I'll ask you, why don't you give us a minute or so your elevator speech on Roost who you are, et cetera. Give us that minute. Sure, absolutely. So Roost is a property telematics platform focused on serving the property insurance industry. And, and what that means is we have developed an end-to-end -end solution that includes some smart home sensors that sense things like water leaks, uh, smoke alarms going off, and so forth. That includes a cloud uh, data analytics platform uh, all the way to a white label mobile app that uh, helps the policyholder mitigate and, and be alerted uh, to some of these perils. And, and we put that together as an end-to-end -end solution uh, for our customers, which are insurance carriers. We're working today with some of the largest, uh, as well as some smaller guys, familiar names like a USAA, Compass Allstate, uh, Erie, uh, Aviva in the UK, to uh, a whole bunch of smaller guys that you've probably never heard of, like Armed Forces or uh, right. Madison Mutual or Franklin Mutual. So quite a plethora of uh, insurance carriers today. Well, they all kind of do the same business. They're just, <laughs> right? The difference is the size of their policies in force. That is exactly right. Typically, they're either their focus area on a, a particular geography or a particular type of business or, or home that, uh, that they're insuring. Right. You know, I think one of the interesting things about your company is you. You are from Belgium originally. Is that correct? That's right. And so tell us a little bit about your background and how Roost, your origination story, how it came to be. Yeah, so I have an engineering degree by, by background in Belgium, and then uh, about over 20 years ago came to Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, here, and 
worked for a variety of startups uh, as early employee, then as a uh, uh, founder, and then once my last company that I started um, was a uh, Wi-Fi semiconductor company where we built some of the lowest power, lowest cost Wi-Fi chips uh, in the world. If you're familiar with, say, the Roku 3 box, that remote control, that's a Wi-Fi remote that has my chips inside. Or if uh, the uh, Fire TV from Amazon, again, that remote control is a Wi-Fi remote with, with my chips inside. So it was a, an exciting uh, company that uh, we ultimately end up um, selling uh, the company in uh, late 2012 uh, to uh, Atmel Corporation, and then which is a large microcontroller company uh, here in the Bay Area. And then about 18 months later is when uh, I started working with my uh, co-founder, James Blackwell, uh, who's our, our CTO, started working on Roost, and as they say, the rest is history. So what in the world made you think, this is a good idea? <laughs> you don't come up with a, a good idea just overnight. I mean, it, it takes blood, sweat, and tears, if you will. I mean, we, when we started ideating, uh, if you will, around uh, smart home, I mean, you have to think back. This is late 2013, early 2014. The notion of IoT or Internet of Things was, was still in its infancy. It wasn't uh, that overhyped term that it is today. Sure. We think we knew a thing or two about it, about Wi-Fi, about specifically low power Wi-Fi. So we, we really uh, were looking at how can we solve some real problems? How can we, when you're looking at a home, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I would love to have a, a full a home automation system. Yeah. Uh, it's right. just not something that, that happens. So the, the thing is, but if that smoke alarm has been chirping in the middle of the night, well, guess what? You wake up in the morning and say, I need to buy some 9-volt batteries. Then yeah. you think about it, right? Exactly right. And by the way, they always mm -hmm. go off in the middle of the night. You know that, right? Of course. Every time, every time. They're designed that way. Seriously. You want to know why? Oh, really? Yeah. No, I'm not kidding. That's built in, huh? Little story here, yeah. Is that true? It is true. I'll tell you why, and I'll explain why. You know, so you okay. get a nine volt battery, right? And so over time, that voltage uh, uh, trickles down to where at some point you reach a cutoff voltage, and that's when it actually is gonna start chirping. Now, it's the inside the battery, it's the lithium or the alkaline, in that sense, the chemicals inside that battery that provide that voltage. And so it's because it's chemicals, yeah, it will always be uh, the lowest voltage when it's the coldest. Uh, in the uh, in the room, oh, so wow. that's why when that thing is at its lowest voltage, it actually will be chirping, but typically between two and four a.m. When it's the coldest time of day in the home. Exactly right. So now that you know that, yeah, next time mm -hmm. when that thing starts chirping at the most inconvenient time, <laughs> turn on the heater, yeah, and you will postpone the problem till the next morning. Yeah, maybe I'll impress my wife at that time by explaining this to her. There you go. There you go. 2 a.m. in the morning. Let me tell you why this is <laughs> I'm not going to change it, but I can tell you why it's happening. Exactly right. And then the next morning, you buy some Roost batteries, and so you never have that problem again because we can let you know in advance and not at uh, 3 a.m. that you have to replace your battery. Perfect. Well, there's the commercial that we even fit into the, the episode. That's awesome. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> that right. That was very well done. Uh huh. I could tell you're kind of sophisticated. I've done this story once or twice. Yeah, actually, as I was saying, I saw you speak years ago at a small conference called the Property Innovation Summit. And you actually gave everybody one of your devices, and we'll talk about your devices mm -hmm. in, a, in a minute. But I remember thinking at the time how incredibly clever this is, because it's certainly it's not a big, cumbersome, bulky thing. It's this little disc. And... I don't even think we were using terms then like insure tech and insurance change and innovation. And, and I mean, so you've really kind of seen the wave coming in, right? And, and you knew to jump on it. That's, that's impressive. Well, you, 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 I think you're giving me more credit than, than I deserve there. You know, it's, I, can, I can say in, in, in hindsight, we didn't plan on, start on focusing on insurance companies. I can, I can, I'll be honest about it. I'm not that smart. But what we did do was when we saw the interest from insurance companies, we, we dove in to understand why and to understand what are they really interested in. And it didn't take very long to start appreciating that from all the claims that insurance companies have, and by the way, they write checks for about $42 billion uh, just for home insurance here in the U.S. every year. About a quarter of that, so about $10 billion of that, is uh, fire claims. 
Yeah. And so when you think about it, when a fire happens in your home and you're there, you're going to hear the smoke alarm, right? Then you're going to do something about it. Yeah. Even if that means running outside, calling 911. The real issue and the real damage it gets done when you're basically not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the smoke alarm goes off. And apart from the dog going crazy and the goldfish not liking it, nothing is happening. Yeah. And the fire spreads until someone on the street actually sees smoke and fire coming out of the house. And of course, then the damage is done. So if you can alert someone to that the smoke alarms are going off and if you can then take action and, and uh, get the fire truck out there, the sooner that that fire truck arrives, the more limited the damage is going to be and the smaller the claim is going to be. So that's kind of the play with insurance where it's really um, we're not going to eliminate the fire, but can we mitigate the damage that is done by a fire? Right. First of all, Let's digress for one second. Tell us what your products are. As far as I understand, you have essentially three products today. Is that correct? Yeah. So if you think about it from a um, sensor perspective, so we have three sensors that we uh, market today. One is actually looks like a 9-volt battery. It literally looks like a 9-volt battery. It works like a 9-volt battery. It actually is a 9-volt battery, but it's much more than that. It actually is a Wi-Fi-enabled, cloud-connected, sensor-packed 9-volt battery. And what you do is you basically plug it into your existing smoke alarm. Yeah, You replace the old battery, the old 9-volt, you replace it with uh, the Roost 9-volt battery. And that transforms that old smoke alarm into a smart smoke alarm. So that when that smoke alarm is going off, it actually will give you a notification on your phone. And as we mentioned earlier already, when that battery is on its last legs, it will actually give you a notification as well to, uh, to replace it. So that battery operates off of a Wi-Fi signal. And is that Wi-Fi signal attached to our home? That is correct, yes. Okay, so somehow that battery hooks up to our Wi-Fi. Does it have to know our password? Do we go on and program that battery? Is that how that works? Yes. Yeah, so basically, there, there is a, a couple of steps where you, you download a mobile app, which can be either the Roost mobile app or your insurance mobile app. And that's where you uh, input your, your Wi-Fi password, connects it to that battery, and then you just plug it into your smoke alarm and you're good to go. Just a couple of minutes and you're good to go. Wow. So really, it sounds like your major objective here is to prevent losses from happening, not deal with the claims once or, or, or the damage, but how to stop the damage. And I think I would imagine the insurance companies are loving that. Yeah, no, it's that, that's exactly right. And so there is a claims mitigation aspect to this. Yeah, there is actually a, another aspect to it, which is really around customer engagement. And, right. and what I mean with that is, as you might imagine, I mean, how often do you communicate or interact with your insurance company? Most people, not that often. Yeah. Yeah, not very often. Beside never. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and on top of that, typically it is either a renewal. So either you have to send them a check or it's at the time of claim. So it's typically a new neutral or a negative uh, experience. Now, if you think about what connected devices in the long run, connected home, will be able to do from a prevention mitigation perspective, that is predicated on the fact that your insurance company is actually able to communicate with you as a policyholder. Now, believe it or not, an insurance company, that typically the only thing from a contact information perspective, the only thing they have is your property address. So they sent this stuff in the mail, yeah, like this this kind of 19th century invention where you actually have this mailbox that uh, uh -huh. sits in front of your house. And it's kind of like, guys, we're in the 21st century, right? If you right. want to communicate with me as a policyholder, have you heard of email? Have you heard of text messages? Have you heard of mobile app notifications? That's how we communicate these days. And, the, and these insurance carriers have none of that. Yeah, they, they have never had an ability or a mechanism to actually uh, use those things. And so one aspect to it is you, you provide uh, a smart home device, be it a, a water leak detector or battery, as kind of an incentive in this way to download that mobile app. And once you download that mobile app, you now have a confirmed email address, confirmed smartphone number, you have a uh, mobile app notification, and you've established that digital communication channel. Yeah. And once you now have that digital communication channel in this day and age, now I can actually deliver additional value to you. So, for example, we have partnered with IBM Watson, the weather company, yeah, where we will provide severe weather alerts. Like there's a hailstorm coming in 30 minutes in your area, put your car inside. Yeah. Now, again, if I put that in the, the U.S. mail yeah, and that arrives three days <laughs> later, not very useful. Yeah. 
But if I can get that to you, it's personalized, it's, it's in your area, it's timely, it's happening shortly, and it's actionable, then it becomes useful to that policyholder and it becomes useful to the carrier. Right. And like you said, you, the keyword engagement, and then there's some engagement between these companies that have historically had almost no engagement. That's a kind of a revolutionary thought that insurance companies could do that. I'm, I'm very interested in your business model, which is kind of what you're talking about. Like, I know that you, and, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but has your business model always been to try to provide your products through the carrier or has that evolved with time? Definitely has evolved. And and if you go back, if you look back four years ago, we started out as a, a direct-to-consumer model. Yeah, we, we did a little Kickstarter campaign to get initial, gauge initial interest. We we were on Amazon and in, in Home Depot and, and, and so forth. And we only started slowly back then uh, appreciating the need and, and, and the requirements that uh, insurance companies had. Over time, and I would say for sure in the last two years, we have now exclusively or we are now exclusively focusing on working with insurance carriers. So we, we are no longer available. We are no longer a retail company where we're selling our products in retail. We're exclusively working with insurance companies to, in typical scenarios, they will give away our product to their policyholders. That's cool. People like free stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and think about it. I mean, uh, one of the... the I would say the issues is that when it comes to water leaks, I mean, people are, uh, or, or even smart smoke alarms, it's not as an exciting thing. Yeah, It's not like uh, I'm watching my dog on a video camera, right? So what's the excitement around uh, water leaks? Well, it's a pretty rational argument that, that you're making there. And so... Unfortunately, a lot of homeowners are like, well, if I have a water leak, I got insurance for that. Yeah. Yes. So, by the way, the insurance carriers don't like to hear that. Yeah, yeah. They don't like that part. Yeah, that makes carriers cringe. Exactly. So how do you now get these incentives aligned Yeah, where you're basically helping your customer take better care of their home and uh, provide this peace of mind? And so that's where making this a, a win-win-win situation where the carrier provides these products free of charge to their customers makes that or uh, alleviates some of that uh, those friction. So in that regard, tell us about HTP, which I think is super interesting, and explain what that is and what you're after there. Sure. So sure. HTP stands for Home Telematics Program. It's an effort uh, that we launched last year. In and, and really, what it was trying, what is it trying to address is in the insurance industry. One thing that that we came to realize, and again, I'm, I was new to the insurance industry. I've been drinking from a fire hose, learning here for the last three, four years. But one thing that we came to realize is that if you want to impact claims, yeah, and if you want to say, well, I'm, you're not going to have that much claims or you're gonna, not going to have to pay out that many claims, the answer from an insurance company is like, well, that's interesting. Show me the data. Yeah? And the reason for that is that insurance companies are run by actuaries. Yeah? And so they love their data. But the, uh, the good and the bad thing is, when you think about it, if your water leaks and, and, and for sure fires, they don't happen that often. Yeah? And you're trying to prove that something is not going to happen in something that doesn't happen that often in the first place. Yeah? So you need a lot of data. Yeah? Like for water leaks, you need 50,000 data years, which is one device installed in a home for, for more than a year and times 50,000. Yeah? And so that's something that is, once you have that data, you can build a, a phenomenal business case on why you should distribute those devices. But in order to build that business case, you need to have the data. And so you're getting this kind of chicken and the egg problem. And so what we did was, okay, we, are, we understand the problem. We, under, we appreciate that there is this, this uh, thirst for actually getting to that data. So what we did was put this program together where we're, in essence, bringing a group of like-minded insurance carriers together to where they're each deploying to a subset of these households. They're each deploying to 7,000 uh, households, these roost kits, and then they're bringing together, they're sharing that data yeah, in an anonymized way, sharing that data. And then that uh, we've retained Willa Stars Watson, which is a uh, highly reputable data analytics, data science company in the insurance industry to help us with slicing and dicing that, that data to indeed prove what the actual impact of these types of devices, what the actual impact is on claims cost. So that's the key goal. What's your hypothesis? What are you expecting to come out of that? 
Well, first and foremost, we're expecting to prove that we're having an impact, Yeah, that we are able to, in case of fire, mitigate some of those uh, losses in the case of water leaks, that we're even able to prevent some of those flames. And so that's on one hand. And the other aspect that we're, we're measuring as part of the program is really around customer satisfaction, retention rates, and so forth. So really that customer engagement aspect and the positive benefits that that's offering the carriers. What is the adoption rate from the actual homeowners? Are you all seeing a high adoption rate for these people receiving these free devices and actually using them? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think there there is nothing that comes for free. Uh, what I mean with that is there is always an, an awareness and an education aspect to it. So one of the things that we have spent quite a lot of time and effort on in the past 12, 18 months is what we call customer journeys, which is how do you actually successfully give something away? Yeah, <laughs> give something in a way that you basically, because you make a proposition like, do you want to get this for free? And the initial answer might, oh yeah, sure, ship it to me, yeah? But that's not uh, doing you any good if, if all you end up doing is shipping Tic Tacs that are sitting on, on a breakfast bar somewhere unopened, yeah? So the real thing you're trying to do is how do I educate that homeowner, yeah, that why they're getting this, why this is important, so that when that box arrives, they are excited about installing that, they're exciting about getting benefit out of that. And so that's what we call the customer journey. And, and it depends on the different assets that an insurance company has. What I mean with that, some are, have more direct relationships with their customers, others are working through independent agents. So that's one example where you're going to have different customer journeys that we have uh, crafted and optimized for different carriers. I like that a lot. So I've seen you refer to yourself, to your company before as a venture-funded telematics for the home mm -hmm. for the PNC industry. Why do you always add the venture funded part? That's a great question. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, I think it's what's important uh, here is that we're a private company. Yeah, and we are funded by some of the, the biggest names from a traditional VC perspective, as well as from strategic insurance companies perspective. Yeah, so USAA, Aviva, Desjardins, they're all investors in the company as well. So I think the, the key message that uh, we're trying to send is that we're, we're a well-funded company, funded for success with the backing of some of the biggest and the brightest uh, in the industry. Right. We work with USAA, too, at our company, and mm -hmm. they're a terrific company, innovative. And I saw that it was just recently announced that they are now added as part of the HTP program, yes? That is right. Yeah, we just announced that last week. Very exciting. They've been a phenomenal partner for us. They're, as you mentioned, they're a very innovative company. They have a phenomenal focus on their members and on their member experience. And it's been actually, we've been partners with them for, for quite a number of years on the solution side, as well as on the investment side. And we've just been, I mean, it's been a, a a phenomenal partnership in respect that we have learned so much from them uh, and, and really helped us craft our product solution, help us improve our product solution. So it's been a great partnership on both ends. So I also heard you in one of your talks talk about the internet of things and the internet of dumb things. What did you mean by that? <laughs> one of the things that I kind of cringe about is that when people talk about, say, smart fridges or a smart washing machine or, or things like that. And they think, or vendors think, that people are going to replace their fridge with a smart fridge because all of a sudden this thing is smart, yeah, and whatever that means. Right. And, and it's like, no, people are not going to do that, yeah? I mean, first and foremost, it's a fridge, yeah, or it's a dishwasher, yeah? That dishwasher says beep because it's finished, that's good enough. I don't really need to see that on my phone, especially not when I'm not at home. So the concept of, of the Internet of Things is not a justification in and of itself to start replacing stuff around the home. And that's why I always focus on what's the problem you're solving yeah? and what's the value you're bringing. And so when I refer to Internet of Dumb Things, what we're really focused on is retrofitting the smarts into place. Yeah? The smoke alarm is a great example. Yeah, you've got a smoke alarm. Yeah, Sure. I, I'm not saying replace your smoke alarm and uh, replace it with something that costs 10 times or more. You know, I'm basically saying you replace a battery, which you're doing anyway. Yeah, Replace that battery with the smarts and, and retrofit the smarts into place. Yeah, and and I think that's a, a key concept where when I 
jokingly refer to it. We're not doing Internet of Things. We're doing the Internet of Dumb Things. We make dumb things smart. Yeah, whether that's your smoke alarm becomes a smart smoke alarm by replacing the battery, or whether that's your garage door where you just stick something to the garage door and all of a sudden you know whether that door is open or closed. Yeah. You know, I like that. Tell us a little more about the garage door. So exactly how does that work? It's a little sensor that basically when your overhead garage door opens or closes, yeah, there is a very clear, there's an accelerometer inside that device that measures whether that's indeed open or closed. Yeah. And so it's a very reliable mechanism that works for overhead garage doors. And I mean, it's one of those things, like how often have we left our home and we're three blocks down the street and your spouse asks you, hey, did you close the garage door? Yeah. It's like, well, did I hit that button or not? You know, and even if I hit that button, did I watch it go down or all the way down? I don't remember. Yeah. So the answer is always, of course, I close. I, it's closed. And, oh, I forgot something else. And we drive back and go check on it anyway. Yeah. yeah. I was on your website and I saw the, the cost of these things or your retail price for your products. And mm -hmm. and you've said a couple times during our episode today, you've used the term low cost. It seems that low cost is important to you and you use that as a competitive advantage. I mean, one of the things in the telematics space, the water IoT space, the home water prevention problem space that you're in is that there's a lot of really cool devices out there. Like we had... Um, Gabe Halimi on, and he told us about his product. It's a fabulous product. It's not inexpensive, but your deal is to make it very affordable. Is that correct? Is that like part of what it seems like low cost or practical cost is important to you guys? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's one thing that's a little bit misunderstood, I think, about the uh, home insurance business or home insurance industry, which is people that look at it from the outside, look at the average premium is like $1,200 per year. And they're like, oh, $1,200 per year. There is a lot of money here. But if you really slice and dice that number and you look at the profitability on that, I mean, about 60% of that goes straight to paying out claims. And, and if you really look at it further, if an insurance carrier makes $30 or maybe $50 in profit on that policy per year, they're doing really well. Yeah. So if you come with a product to market that costs hundreds of dollars, well, that's the profitability for multiple years. And it's like, well, they're not going to give that up to give something away. So then the amount of dollars that are actually available from a, a customer engagement perspective for, for experimenting with some of these new devices, it's actually not that much. And so that's where we found actually some great traction and kindred spirits in the home insurance industry because the price points that we were at were actually things that resonated or things that were within the budget, within the envelope of what fitted with them. Uh, the other thing that should be mentioned here is that there's also our regulators, yeah, the insurance regulators. And so there is actually very strict restrictions on what you can give away to policyholders. And it's called the rebating and the inducement uh, laws. And so it's it's not allowed, and then that cap is oftentimes twenty dollars, thirty dollars. I mean, in that price range, what you're allowed to give something away. If it's more than that, it's just not allowed by law. Yeah, you know, you really hit on it. Cost is extremely important. Uh, you have a product that makes dumb things smart, and you were able to do it at a very normal cost, a cost that somebody would say, "Yeah, I, I can do that." You know, I'm sitting here looking at it and thinking. Oh yeah, I can do that. I I get it now. I don't need to buy a new smoke alarm. I can buy a battery to make my smoke alarm smart. And uh, a lot of times we deal with a lot of companies that have fantastic ideas. It's just the price is out of this world or it's just right above what we're able to do. And it's a product that we'd like to be a part of, but it's just sometimes too much. Sure. I mean, we have that. We work on the strictly on the claims end of the business. And we have that with some of the insure tech and the new tech, cool, fun tools that are out there, some of them that, that even solve significant problems, nobody wants to pay. <laughs> they want the cost of a claim to go down, not up, even if maybe there's an interesting data play. So I agree with what Lee's saying. Yeah, kudos to you to making a, a device using the technology and all the knowledge that you have from a past work experience and really bring it in, into the space. I think it's, you know, really something that can revolutionize the industry. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Rule, I just want to ask you one last question about your battery. 
Is it rechargeable? Does it last longer than a 9-volt battery? How does that part work? Yeah, great question. So a typical 9-volt battery, you typically have to replace them within a year, maybe 18 months uh, or so. Our battery lasts more than three years in a typical smoke alarm. And on top of that, you actually can then purchase a, a replacement battery. Yeah, So it's, it's not rechargeable, but it's replaceable. And so for a small fee, you can buy a replacement battery to then plug it on to the smart module and have another three plus years of battery life out of that device. Just real quick, you have the three devices on the market now. Can you talk about what we can look forward to next? Yeah, I think uh, um, not in a lot of detail, but I think there's kind of two tangents to our roadmap. You will see us coming out with other sensors, other interesting devices that are either very relevant to insurance carriers or relevant to policyholders, to consumers. Uh, so that that's one aspect. On the other hand, uh, you'll see us uh, continue to innovate on our mobile app side and adding more mobile app services. So I mentioned severe weather alerts already. We actually have a, a relationship with uh, Home Advisor as well to tie together contractor recommendations. So if you have that water leak, you can actually hit a button to get a call back from a local plumber within 90 seconds. So adding more value-added services around that peace of mind and helping you take care of your home and your loved ones, that's really what we're here and what we're focused on. Right. It's not, you know, it's like what we just saw with, you know, Apple do this week. I mean, they're a hardware company or they have been traditionally, but now they're trying to push into the services part or to have services support the sale of their hardware services, increase their revenues. And it sounds like you guys kind of see similar opportunities. Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, the hardware is a means to an end. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to deliver value added services to your policyholder. And uh, being able to do that based on some new data points or unique data points or unique triggers, there is a whole uh, slew of services that become very relevant, uh, very focused and very timely. And that's what we're, uh, we're here to do. Well, I think that's a great place to bring this to a close. We really appreciate learning about your company. And I got to say, I'm even more impressed with it now than I was before. I think that you have taken a complicated problem and tried to find a very practical solution to it. And uh, uh, we appreciate that. And we thank you a lot for your time and for being with us today. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk some more about Roost. You got it. Maybe we'll see you at a conference somewhere. I'm sure we will. <laughs> you're at most of them anyways. We're out there a lot trying to get the message out. Okay, thanks. And we'll talk to you again. Thank you, Rob. Really appreciate it. You know, I have to tell you, Lee, that was one of my favorite episodes yet. Well, I mean, it was a very interesting episode. I liked it because, you know, most of the time I know exactly what I'm walking into. Uh, this one, I didn't quite have all the knowledge I needed. And so I was able to learn a lot on that podcast. Yeah. I mean, it was very educational. It's interesting. And I, I want to underscore this. I heard him speak. It has to be four years ago or so, maybe close to five. It was a long time ago. I heard him speak at a conference and he gave out one of his little water devices to everybody that was there. There's maybe a hundred people there. And he never used the word insure tech. I don't even know that he used the term IOT at the time. I mean, that's just to show you how far it's come, right? In this short period right. of time, somebody came up with the word or term insure tech, and now it's kicked around all over the place. There's tons of conferences about it, insure tech, insure tech, insure tech. But here's somebody who's been around long enough to actually pivot on their business model from we're going to sell this to consumers to wait a second, maybe we should provide it through the carrier. Very different perspective and uh, apparently successful. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot for a company to pivot their marketing approach right? You as a genius behind marketing, right? You understand that. You know, I, kudos to them to being able to see, is there another way that we could approach the market? And I mean, they have big companies who are backing them, big, smart companies like USAA and, and just numerous ones that understand the need and understand what they're doing. Yeah. They have uh, other progressive companies involved in their HTP program that I've read about, like State Auto, who is one of our customers, but also very progressive, very out front and involved in new age thinking. But back to their business model, low cost, it's a good idea. If this is something that's affordable, maybe the uptake will be much higher. 
Yeah, I would agree with the low cost. And I also agree with this discussion on customer engagement. You know, this is a application that's able to be used through an app. Uh, you can white label it and you are now engaging with a the customer. Their roadmap for maybe weather alerts or their roadmap for some other things. Pretty neat, you know, marketing approach to how am I going to get right in front of my customer all the time, not just whenever they need me, but all the time. Yeah, I think that some of the stuff that they're doing is very creative and clever. We are talking with Rule offline about which parts of the insurance company is interested in his product, and it's not just the claims area. Right. It's the underwriting area and the marketing area. I mean, it's a product that several different functional areas can use to help them in their work and their goals. Very clever. Yeah, limiting claims, preventing claims, and then customer engagement. That touches so many parts of a company. Right, and then proper underwriting or giving data, right? Right. Like when he was talking about the HTP part and providing data back to the actuaries. That's cool. That's smart. So anyways, an impressive organization, quite different than the other water device we talked to, Flow. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's just a different thing, but, you know, Flow at the same time is also trying to uh, engage the customer, prevent water losses, talk to these different organizations and these different parts of a company. So it seems like it's two mm-hmm. like-minded individuals who are trying to better the world. Right. And Gabe would say that he sees them as a, uh, you know, plumbing is in their DNA. And we didn't ask rule that, but my guess is, is he would say that they're a tech company. <laughs> and, and I would say Wi-Fi is in his DNA. Wi-Fi is in his DNA. Yeah. Which, uh, probably not a bad thing to have in your DNA. No, no. He's a very, very smart person. Well, anyways, we uh, are so appreciative to Rule for making some time today. And this is our last podcast before PLRB, which we're really excited for. By the time this gets on the air, PLRB will be a distant memory. But um, we thank you, as always, for being with us. And we ask you to please subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, whatever your favorite platform may be. Yeah, we appreciate all of you listening. So that's it for today. We will talk to you next time. Bye, everybody.